uh, share our data with you. And uh, I hope I won't over talk too much, but uh, I'll try to speak fast then. Um, so, um, pet fade is T5. Um, long, flexible tail. Um, and what we're interested in is uh, how, when upon interaction with QA, which is the outer membrane protein receptor of E. coli, how it uh, perforates the membrane. So here it's just a proton liposome reconstituted with only QA and E. coli lipids. And you can see it's a special liposome here, has two membranes, mimicking the two membranes of the uh, of, the, of E. coli. And so you see everything's in the phase allowing it to perforate the two membranes. And so our question is how, how does it do that? Um, I'll go very quickly. It's uh, been working on, on T5 tail for a while. And, and so I've been um, now focusing on the tip of tail of, of, uh, of, um, of T5. So, um, of course, we've been studying that with electron microscopy, uh, cryo-EM, uh, and we have um, uh, had a quite nice uh, uh, structure, uh, well, um, map of the tail, which, in which we could uh, very nicely um, trace all the proteins. And so we could, um, we had uh, located all the proteins except 240, and 243, so I'll mention our office. 240 is, is exactly the same fold as um, the major uh, tail protein here, PB6, uh, except that it's surrounded by a dodecamer of 232, uh, which is the color that allows the um, l shaped fibers to, uh, to uh, be attached to the, to the tail. I won't be discussing about that, however, the major tail protein has the, uh, some uh, decoration domains, and so P140 lacks those decoration domains to allow the dodecama of P132 to assemble around it. I won't talk much about the other proteins. I will focus on the on PB3, which is the um, base, plate, base plate hub protein, which closes the tube because it's, a, it's, 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 it's quite an interesting protein here. Um, so um, this is a detail of the of the of the structure of this protein, and when you compare it to um, the base plate hub protein of T4, um, you can see I've colored with the same color code um, uh, domains that, that are uh, structurally similar. So we have hub domain one, two, uh, three, and four. And however, in P3, you have insertion in, in, in domain uh, 2, with a large insertion and a plug domain. And in C terminal of the protein, you have a long linker here, which um, ends with two fibronectin domains that start to form the straight fiber. Might have gone a bit fast on the, um, on the introduction. Let me come back. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so you have this. Um, uh, L fibers here, uh, the extremity of which uh, binds to the lipopolysaccharide. Uh, they allow the, the phage to walk on the membrane until PD5, which is the receptor binding protein at the tip of this straight fiber here, meets QA. And this is the trigger for uh, infection. Okay? So, um, so here, the straight fiber is uh, formed uh, on its upper part by two fibronectin domains of this base plate hub protein here. Um, the protein is a trimer, um, and it closes, and you see that the plug domain really close, nicely closes, this is a top view of the trimer, nicely closes the tube. Um, uh, in, in T4, the tube is closed by um, GT5, uh, OD fold uh, domain here, whereas the uh, spike here continues the uh, um, um, so here is, is the view from the from a uh, bottom view. I've removed the two fibronectin domains, and you nicely see indeed that uh, the the um, the tube is closed by this plug domain. And I insist on the localization on on the structure of this long linker here. It's just not uh, a banal linker. It's it's a linker that is really 
it makes connection between two um, neighboring domains, neighboring subunits. It, it really makes interaction between neighboring subunits. And it also interacts with the plug domain. And this, I would like you to remember because it's clip number A. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so when we look inside of this um, closed tube, um, so here this is the plug domain, you see the link up here, but that's my uh, contact. And the, the sub side connecting domain also uh, contributes to the closing of the tube. And here we had a, a, a little density here, and uh, we could just trace 35 amino acids in C terminus of the tape measure protein, which is uh, C terminus here, and the N terminus goes up to the capsid, and the length of this protein gives the length of the tape. And, and so uh, this protein is, is completely uh, unresolved in the, in the tail tube. Uh, probably it's the, it's the coil coil. Uh, it, it's the trimer. That was a surprise because it was thought it was a pentamer or hexamer. It's the trimer. And the coil coil of the trimer is too small to make interaction with the uh, four section wide uh, tail tube. Uh, but that sort of makes sense because you don't want that protein to be stuck too much in the tail tube because it's expelled when the the DNA, the, the DNA has to go through. So uh, this tail, uh, tape measure protein is quite a fascinating protein. Uh, it's an assembly of C5 tape tail, and it, this is true also for lambda and uh, for other phages. It is um, it is it is uh, uh, cleaved um, by a non-known protease. We don't know whether it's from the host or from the phage. However, at the end of the tail assembly, it is cleaved, and we thought that this little bit of protein was discarded. However, not, it, is, it is absolutely not, because we resolved uh, this part. And, um, and here we have, uh, I don't know why the, um, it's not very nicely resolved. However, um, this is, uh, has a, it has this little bit has a zinc carboxy peptidized uh, um, yeah. um, and what's interesting, so, yeah, uh, yeah P num uh, number, number B, number vector B, um, you see that this um, uh, is, is, the, is the area of the, of the, of the, of the map, which is the um, uh, best, best result. And you see that this um, little trimer of C terminus of the tape measure protein makes a very nice interaction with the, with the plug domain, which is why it's nicely resolved. And when you compare um, the structure of uh, the hub proteins of the uh, uh, three um, base plates of sickle phages that are sickle phages related uh, structures that we have, so, uh, so in, in red you have um, this domain of um, tape measure of C5. Also have the tape measure of uh, AT alpha, a stuff phase, and of GTA megatron protein, and that's the end terminus. Uh, of. And you see that when you overlay the base plate hub, hub protein, um, this structure is remarkably um, um, conserved. So it might have a meaning in that may, maybe nucleus neutralization of the, of the assembly process of the phase. Okay. Um, so how how so, so then uh, we did the phase the the straight fiber continues with PD4. Um, so it's the trimer. You see that you don't have at all interactions between those three fiber connecting domains in either of those. Here you start to have so you then there's three um, fiber connecting domains in the trimer of PD4. So you have here 12, you know, 9. Uh, fibronectin domains, and you see those fibronectin domains are really connected, they're really strong interactions. And then the polypeptide goes into a spike, uh, which is a mixture of uh, beta sheet and intertwined beta helix uh, spike, as you uh, 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 often see in, in spikes or fibers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, phages. And you have small decorating domains. Unfortunately, we couldn't um, solve the structure of PD5. It was too wobbly. Um, but we'll talk about that later. Um, okay. Um, so now we have the structure of the tail tip before interaction with the receptor. What happens 
when we incubate the tails with the, with the receptor. So I told you the receptor is a membrane protein, uh, so that we have to extract from the membrane to purify, and it's purified in detergent. Uh, it's purified in detergent, and when you do um, um tails with um, detergent solidized protein, uh, well, indeed, that something happens. The tail now uh, is completely empty, uh, the tube is open, but then they don't see much. So we thought, well, it's not going to be very interesting to solve that structure. And we thought, well, what happens in vivo? Well, there's a membrane here, so maybe we have to provide a membrane. And so we reconstituted QA in a little part of membrane and analogous. And we took the uh, largest nanodisc uh, membrane coupled protein to make the largest numbers possible to accommodate both QA and some bilayer, uh, additional bilayer. And what do you see? Well, you see something really um, gets stabilized here. You see the tail tube is partially empty. You, you say, well, yeah, it might be but still full. You see the nanodisc here, really, um, um, uh, here. And you drop something going through, you see a tink of something on the side. Uh, yeah, and this is not typical of my best because all of the, yeah, all of the tails are the same. So you have the nano disc, it's partially empty but partially full. You have something going through um, the nano disc here. And so we uh, just, uh, determine the structure of this sample too, and this is what we get. So this is high contour level, non uh, unmasked just to see everything we could see and things we couldn't uh, trace, unfortunately, it was too fuzzy. Uh, the resolution was not good enough. So what we could see is, is the, the l shaped fibers. They are either down or up. So we have two preferential um, Yeah. Um, so this is PD5, the receptor binding protein. This is the nanodisc. You clearly see something going through. Uh, yeah, and you clearly see something in the in the tube here. And, and, yeah. it, it, at lower, it's still to that low resolution, um, and, and uh, uh, you clearly see a channel going through uh, the nano disc in register with the tail tube. So here it's really a nice. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't resolve the structure of the, of the channel going through the nano disc. Uh, and so we, everything that's colored we could trace. And so what happens is that the, the, um, the, uh, the straight fiber that goes down is now bent on the side, okay? So you have the spike here, which is surrounded by all of the fiber domains. domain, yeah? So you have the hand, which is PB5. You have the arm, which is the PB2. So you have the spike going to the elbow, and then you have the fibronectin domain, and it just goes up like that, okay? Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. See them here, okay? Um, and so, what do we have? We have the initial structure, the final structure. What can we learn from going from one to the, to the next? Now, it's a mold. Um, uh, I didn't put the uh, here so that things don't go across. Uh, However, it's a it's, it's major rearrangement of this um, base plate hot protein. What do we see? So we see that those fibronectin domains are, are, are moved to the side. Moving to the side, they pull on the slinker here. Pulling on the slinker, they, like a zip, undo the interaction between two neighboring subunits here and um, interaction with the plug domain. And the plug domain probably was, well, this protein was folded in a metastable conformation. And so when you pull on a little bit, then it relaxes into a, a more stable conformation, which makes that the plug domain really springs out in the beta helix going downward. Okay? Um, yeah. You, you see nicely from the top view that you open, really nicely open the, uh, uh, the tail tube. And that, so you have two, uh, uh, two rings, but this upper ring here, uh, which does not change uh, at all between the two structures, it's, uh, yeah. and, and here this side, which sort of opens a little bit. Uh, so uh, here you have tight interaction, 
the, the linker moves away, and so this thing like opens a little bit on the side, leaving a, 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 a hole in between two neighboring problems. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, just uh, the same thing that um, started. And uh, so what's interesting is that the advocate, so this the resolution is not super great. That's why it's not very nice. However. Um, here at the tip, you have leucine, selenine, lysine, leucine, which nicely would um, insert into the outer leaflet of the outer membrane. And here, nicely as, as well, you have uh, positive patches that could nicely interact with the um, uh, phosphate of the um, um, lipoplosaccharides that are right in the outer le uh, leaflet of the outer membrane. So, clues again. Uh, remember, uh, you have two confirmations of this basically top protein. And, um, and so, yeah, uh, the, the nanodisc, uh, so here, this would plunge into the, the nanodisc here. And uh, so here is, is, a, is, a, is a slice through the, uh, the, the density. You see nicely that there's something that makes a channel through the membrane. Uh, unfortunately, you can't resolve it, but it's just definitely something here. Um, this is the A that we guess. Um, and, 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 and. Here, I told you there was a space, uh, and the space was not free in the structure. We have density here. And uh, Romain Linares, who solved the structure, tried at the beginning to fix this sequence because this was not very well nicely resolved in this density, but we really couldn't make it. And in the end, it's uh, the, the, the uh, red protein we can solve here is the C terminus of the long peptide of the tape measure protein. So that in red here is, is this sequence here. Uh, so you have the C terminus here, there's a plot there, yeah, and it, here we lose we lose density, we can't um, solve anything anymore, but we can nicely, well, we can sort of guess that it goes down nine amino acids, and uh, it should be underlined until here. I don't know why that's gone. Um, and so nine amino acids, this is just long enough to go here. And what happens here, which is underlined, is a hydrophobic stretch that would, um, that forms two, um, and that was shown by Pascal Boulanger, forms two uh, hydrophobic transmembrane domains. And this would nicely just bring those two alpha helices, um, hydrophobic uh, transmembrane helices, to the, um, to the um, outer uh, membrane to form a channel. So this channel would be formed by the tape measure protein. Good. Um, so that's, uh, that's not a clue here. Um, uh, so there's an anchoring. So the, the, the membrane, the cell tube is anchored to the outer membrane by the base pig hub protein, by the QAPD5 complex, and by this PD2 channel protein that uh, is just not insert, only inserts into the outer membrane. Oh dear. Uh, it also, um, talk to you, uh, uh, it also anchors, so I'll, I'll, I'll okay, uh, it's important. Um, uh, Different twist. It's amazing. You use the gel, well, you, it's just a spike. No, it's just a spike. However, when you compare the densities of the spike before and after the interaction with the receptor, well, this is in register, okay? Uh, so it's before and after. And here it's not in register anymore at all. And so there's a different twist. And when you compare that, so meaning that, that would, you would twist, and so you would pull on this linker, um, dissociating those. Uh, those uh, uh, Fibronectin uh, uh, domain uh, interaction. Oh, yeah. So we solved the structure of two A and two five complex as well, and um, and and it fits perfectly well in the density here. We don't have um, here we missed quite a lot of uh, of, of sequence, and we did an alpha fold different structure of PD five alone. Um, it uh, proposes that all of that is uh, unfolded. Is, is uh, not uh, folded, um, and this is completely coherent with all the uh, previous data we have. Uh, yeah. um, 
terrible, terrible. Um, however, it, it, it proposes a structure for this that we don't have, and, and this really nicely fits into the map. And so we have we go from a three-fold symmetry here to a, a, a one-fold symmetry, uh, continuing this uh, this uh, beta spike beta helix. And uh, however, when we fit that, it's not at all um, in, in, in well, it doesn't fit. And so you have to have a kink here. And um, and so yeah, well I'll, I'll skip that. Um, so putting everything together, uh, we believe that um, you have um, the lower part of PD5, which is not structured. It gets structured upon um, binding to the receptor. The structuration. The rigidification of the protein uh, goes up to this uh, little PD4 binding domain, imposing uh, a kink. This kink would, would, would impose um, a, 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 a twisting of the helix, which would go up here, pull on the linker here, disengage the interaction between these three fibronectin domains, allowing the straight fiber to uh, fold on the side. This would in turn pull on this linker here, releasing the plug domain, which would spring out, insert into the um, into the outer leaflet uh, of the outer of the outer membrane, um, releasing um, the interaction with the tape measure protein. This little bit would be released, digest the peptidyl glycan, and this uh, other part of the tape measure protein would insert into those um, uh, subunits and, and form a channel here. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we also uh, have proposed a, uh, a location for the tail completion protein. Uh, and so uh, uh, I won't go into the details, but please, people who know about this protein, come and see me because I really wonder what this protein does do. And I just want to thank people who did the work, and Romain Linares, and Charles Arnaud, it's a beautiful collaboration with the team of Vichon, and also Seth Serafine, who's supposed to write the so, uh, I'm terribly sorry to come to the time, but it's predicted. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cecil. <laughs> I think we have time for two questions. Yeah. I have a question. So, could the receptor adopt some uh, um, oligomeric state that's like so it's a monomer at all times? So, it has one fold and go. It's just a receptor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, super cool. So, uh, you want to. you have the contraction? You don't have a contraction. No, no, I want, sorry. Terminology. Uh, the the bending. Exactly. Yes, thank you. So you have something that is symmetrical, like a triangle. Yeah. It goes yeah. to one direction. Do yeah. you think it's somehow coordinated, or is kind of random, so it, it goes to a random direction, or is there some you know, heterogeneity, like one side of the trimer, which is kind of is more, more malleable to the bending, or is it all random? So I, I, I can I go back uh, a slide? Yeah, no, 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 this one. Yeah. Um, so in fact, in fact, it's not symmetrical because we have. So uh, when we rec this is D three, and you see there's there's a little density here, and we thought well, it seems to be something. And so Roma solved the structure in C one, and indeed he could he could clearly could clearly identify a density here. Unfortunately, it's not very well resolved. However, um, my spec of, of tails. Um, say that the tail completion protein is here, and we couldn't put it anywhere else. We solved also the, the structure of the other part of the other end extremity of the of the tail. It's not there, and and if you do an after fold addition of this protein, it fits well in here. Well, after a bit of tweaking, and so this is not this is not C3. It's C1, and so probably it's, it, this might. Um, uh, oops. Um, yeah, um, trigger bending in one side, but we don't know. And we don't find this protein um, in, in the reconstruction after interaction with the receptor. So we don't really know what it's doing. Okay, I think this is it. We have to terminate the discussion now. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
And now our next speaker is Emma Shedini, who is going to talk about two portals in a tail, which I'm a bit suspicious of, so I'm quite curious. Which one is the laser pointer? I mean, I'm really scared of this guy. Does it? Uh, sorry. So uh, my name is Emma. I'm a postdoc in the Kelch lab at UMass, um, and I hope my talk won't be too um, surprising. Uh, so uh, I'd like to thank all of the organizers um, for giving me the opportunity to share this work, um, and it's a great pleasure to not have to explain what phage are um, and why you should care about them. Uh, so instead, I'll just start by saying that all viruses have to find and find their hosts, um, and the virus that we're going to talk about next is called P7426. I didn't name it. I'm sorry. Um, and it is a phage of Thermos thermophilus, which is a thermophilic bacterium. Um, you might think it looks a little weird. Uh, and that's because it has the longest known tail of any virus. Um, and so we can start at these capsids up here, and we can trace all the way down the tail here um, to where the tail tip complex is. Um, and we also know that after uh, binding onto its host with the tail tip complex, um, the virus can uh, deliver its genome, um, which we see here, uh, because this, um, this stage has emptied its head, and this stage still contains its DNA. Um, so this is my uh, depiction of thermos uh, being attacked by uh, this phage. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this phage is because uh, this is actually very difficult for it. Um, it lives in this hot spring, which is very hot. Um, so it has to ex survive extreme temperatures in order to be able to complete its life cycle. Um, but not only that, the um, environment is very sparse. So most of the phages that we study uh, live uh, in the human microbiome, where the bacteria are very plentiful. Um, and in the hot spring, they are not. Um, and also, only a small percentage of them are the, the correct species and strain. Um, so we were wondering, how does P7426 do this? Um, I can't tell you the answer to that yet, um, but we thought that understanding the binding proteins would be the first step to doing this. Um, and uh, we know that receptor binding proteins are typically found at phage tail tips. Uh, so a former graduate student in the lab named Emily Ann Yellow um, asked what proteins make up the P7426 tail tip. Um, we're going to break PJ's first rule. We don't know the, we didn't know the components going in um, because our system doesn't have any genetic tools, um, and most of the proteins in the sequence genome have no homology to anything. Um, so whoops, we thought uh, this is really sensitive. Um, we thought that uh, we would follow the Feynman rule and just look at it and see if we could get some clues to how it was working. So we took a structural biology approach. Um, what Emily did is she purified P7426 virions. She put them on cryo-EM grids, which were imaged on the Talus Arctica, um, and then she proceeded to reconstruct uh, the volume of the tail chip, um, which I'm showing you here. She got some very nice volumes. Um, you will notice, uh, for those of you who are used to looking at page tail chips, it doesn't look like a lot of other tail chips. Um, it's also been reconstructed with 12-fold symmetry in force, which is pretty unusual for a page tail chip. Um, and even after getting this reconstruction, Emily still had a pretty big conundrum, um, which is because we didn't know the components, uh, she couldn't really build anything into this density for a very long time. Um, but she used a combination of structural approaches um, to uh, build into this density. So Model Angelo and Deep Chaser um, both build automatically into prior density, and then also um, using uh, structural prediction algorithms to, um, to predict the structure of uh, proteins in the sequence. Um, and using a combination of these uh, approaches, we identified um, two hypothetical proteins, previously hypothetical proteins in the P7426 genome as uh, components of the tail tip. But most surprisingly, um, she saw that the portal protein um, made a complex at the very distal tip of the tail, tail tip complex. Um, we were very surprised by this, as I'm sure you guys also are, um, because we thought that portal proteins would only ever be found in phage next, um, where we've heard a lot about them today. Um, in this uh, five-fold vertex, um, where it serves as the conduit for the genome, among other things. Um, but we went back and we looked at the raw micrographs, and um, it did kind of pass the first test. So looking at these raw micrographs, um, the volume that Emily reconstructed looked like the volume that you would expect from um, these micrographs, which is at the tail, the tail tip. 
Um, and I actually had been staring at a lot of micrographs, and I thought this looked pretty familiar, um, because uh, here I'm showing you um, a, a phage that has ejected its genome, um, and you can see the neck of this, of this uh, phage right next to a tail tip of a different phage. Um, and I thought that I had this hunch that they would be the same, um, which didn't make any sense to us at all. So obviously I wanted to uh, figure out what, what was going on. Um, I was also really lucky that um, Emily had collected a similar data set on the Creos, um, which is a slightly more powerful EM microscope, um, for a different purpose that ended up not panning out. So I got to play with uh, these data. Um, I was very lucky. Um, so the first challenge is picking the net particles. Um, this is also a pretty big data set, so uh, doing it manually wasn't really uh, an option. Um, and I also really wanted to be very careful to avoid contamination of the net particle stack with tail tip particles, because we know that they look quite similar. Um, I use Topaz, which is a machine learning approach. It uses conv convolutional neural networks. Um, so I did uh, about 4,000 manual picks from 2,000 micrographs. Um, and I used that to train this model. And then I ran the model on the entire set of micrographs. Um, and so shown in green circles are the, um, the picks that the model found. And with white arrows, um, I'm pointing to the true positive. So those are the, those are the phage net. Um, I was also really pleased to see up here that there was a tail tip that it did not pick. So it's correctly identified that as a negative. Um, and I also was sort of encouraged by looking at some of these false positives. There are kind of things that you would uh, be okay confusing for a net because they're usually places that the tail of another phage overlaps with the vertex of a passive. So that's, that's a really encouraging sign to me. Um, I did many, many, many rounds of 2D classification, 3D classification, every kind of classification to filter out these false positives and also curate my particle stack. Um, and I actually repeated this entire process with training a new neural network um, to pick tail tip particles um, from this higher quality data set. So um, everything that I show you going forward about the tail tip is going to be from, from this same data set and my reconstruction. Um, looking at 2D representative 2D classes, um, I was still seeing stuff that looked really the same. Um, so we didn't really get any clues from that. Um, and then when I went ahead and reconstructed these, again with um, 12-fold symmetry applied, um, they looked super similar. Um, so I'll point out that in the neck, you can see that um, there's some capsule density there. Um, and uh, it, it is uh, weaker, and it's blurred out because that capsule vertex is 5-fold symmetric. So we would not expect that to resolve when we're um, putting 12-fold symmetry over it. We also know that the tail tube itself is C3. Um, so again, that's also getting blurred out when you apply um, 12-fold symmetry. So if I cut open the, um, the volume, uh, so we can see inside that there's density for the tape measure protein running throughout, and also probably some of this up here is double-stranded DNA. Um, there's a loop of DNA wrapped around the portal up there, which is really nice. Um, the, the tape measure itself, we don't get sufficient density to resolve it, and it's also probably not to be 12, so that kind of checks out. Um, and actually, if I compare these two, so now I'm showing you a difference map where stuff that is um, more present, more density present in the neck is purple. So the capsid and that loop of DNA, as you would expect, is purple. Um, there's some bits of the, the tape measure protein that are maybe you know a bit more um, resolved in, in the neck than in the tail. Um, but overall, the protein components are pretty much identical between these two complexes. Um, so now I wanted to know, of course, are they actually the same proteins, or do they just kind of look the same? Um, and again, I really wanted to take an unbiased approach to doing this. So I turned back to Model Angela, which is a uh, tool for automatic model building and for prior EM maps. Um, and it's actually able to build into a map without sequence input. Um, so I wasn't biasing it by what I thought these proteins were. Um, and the way that it does that is it builds into your side chain density, so it basically sequences it visually for you. Um, I'm showing you. Uh, the C terminal tail of uh, P90, which is my favorite part of this complex. I don't know why. Um, but you get really good density, and it fits it in really well. Um, so it made my job really easy. Uh, I extracted all of the polypeptides from, um, that, it, that it gave me, and it ran it against the um, protein database in BLAST. Um, and I only got hits to portal P90 and 112, which were the components that Emily had pulled out again. Um, and I did this for both the neck and the tail. Um, so I kind of came to the begrudging conclusion that the neck and the tail could contain the same proteins. Um, I was really still thinking that there would be some differences. So um, now we started looking for conformational differences. And of course, I started with the portal because um, that was just the absolutely most weird and surprising finding. So I went ahead and um, I uh, 
manually verified all of the model and flow builds. Um, they were they were great. I didn't have to do a lot of work. Um, and I'm also showing you here just a model of the um, the portal complex. Um, and so uh, Ali and uh, uh, Fred uh, solved um, two actually two uh, complexes of a very closely related portal. Um, and I'm just going to point out two um, really important features. So the crown up here and the tunnel loops. This is the pore that DNA passes through, and the tunnel loops constrict in order to stop DNA from passing through. Um, so I'm just pointing those out because they're going to be important in a minute. Um, and now I'm going to subtract uh, 11 of the 12 monomers of portal. So I'm just showing you one. Um, and I'm going to compare it from between the tail tip and the neck. And I can overlay it, and then we overlay it pretty much perfectly. So now I'm coming to the conclusion that actually they're in the same confirmation. Um, and even more, uh, because Ali and Fred um, solved an open and a closed confirmation of the portal, I can compare them to these uh, really nice models. Um, and if I overlay them, I see that both the neck and the tail portal um, are in the closed confirmation. So it has this um, tunnel loop here in the same position as in the closed confirmation of the crown, also in the same uh, position, whereas it's it is different um, from the open one. Okay, so now, now I've come to the conclusion that uh, there are identical portal complexes at both ends of the tail. Uh, something must be different. So I looked to the next protein, which is P90. Um, and I, again, I went and I uh, manually verified all of Model Angela's builds. I'm not going to show you the overlay for time, but it's the same. Um, I also ran uh, the build through um, the DALI structural homology server, and I was a little bit encouraged um, to find that it is actually very similar to um, other uh, neck proteins across um, a whole variety of stages, actually. Um, so this does seem like a bona fide neck protein. Um, but I also at this time started to wonder how the C3 tail connects to the C12 portal. Um, so there, there's some, has to be some kind of uh, symmetry bridging that goes on here. Um, in order to figure this out, I uh, took my same particle stacks and did some re asymmetric and C3 reconstructions using the same um, technique again with model Angelo. Um, I was able to identify that there's another protein here, uh, P90, a hypothetical protein, uh, sorry, P92, a hypothetical protein, um, and it's actually a hexamer. Um, so it's really nicely able to bridge the symmetry gap there. Um, and even more excitingly, um, when I put it through Dolly, it's homologous to the lambda tail terminator, um, which is uh, also a protein that you expect to find in phage next. Um, and again, looking at a monomer of each of them and overlaying them, you can see that there is very good structural homology there. Um, so Emily, in addition to um, looking at the tail tip complex initially, she also did a lot of work on the structure of the tail tube. Um, and like other phage tails, it has polarity. So if you look at one ring of the uh, tail tube from the side. The top here has sockets and the bottom has loops. Um, and so I wanted to know if the junction with the tail was different in um, either of these complexes. Again, thinking there must be some different. Um, this is the model that Emily built. Um, again, you can see the, uh, it's very different on the top compared to the bottom interface. Um, and when I went into my C3 and asymmetric um, volumes, I was able to perfectly fit Emily's uh, C3 uh, structure model into the density. I uh, didn't really have to do any work on that either. It just snapped right into place. Um, and it is indeed showing the same interface to um, P92 on both sides there. Um, so the really surprising um, conclusion from this is that means that actually the tail rings must, must split polarity somewhere along its tail. So it's assumed that in most stages the tail uh, starts at the tail tip and it goes to the um, neck, and it has the same polarity of the rings all the way along. Um, but I now know that the loops are actually both facing towards the middle of the phase. Um, and I don't know how it, how it does that. <laughs> um, so just very quickly, um, the last protein that we know about is um, P112, which forms this part of the collar. It is also 12-fold symmetric. Um, and actually, each one of these lobes is made of two dimers of, or sorry, one dimer of um, P12, um, and we don't know a, a lot about this, but um, I think it has to do with host recognition, so we're probably going to, uh, we're excited to look more into that. Um, and then altogether, um, what I've found is that these two complexes are nearly identical. These are the models that I've built with the help of Monalangelo. Um, they are indeed pretty much identical. Um, so uh, this is one of these great discoveries that really leaves us with more uh, questions and answers. There's so many things that we want to know now, um, <laughs> rather than being uh, more uh, more clarity, we're we're excited to do more work. 
Um, so we know that the portal protein is in both the neck and the tail tip complexes, but the implication of that is that the portal has to do host recognition in the tail tip. And that is really uh, weird. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine how it would be able to evolve that, um, that activity while maintaining its canonical role. Um, in addition, we know that the tail tip complex is a duplicate of the neck complex. Um, it has the same proteins and the same conformations. Only the tape measure and the capsid differ. Um, so this is a very strange problem to imagine how it would assemble. Um, so we don't get double-headed or double-tailed phages. Um, we don't really know why. Um, and finally, we know that the tail rings flip polarity somewhere in the tail. Um, we don't know where. <laughs> we don't know how. Um, but uh, we, we do think that it's not possible for the two loops to, to stick together. That would be like trying to stick two Lego bricks together from the wrong side. So that shouldn't work. Um, and finally, I would just like to thank Brian um, for the opportunity to work on this weird page that surprises us at every turn. Um, the health lab is a great place to work, and he's not here, so I don't have to say that. Uh, this is Team Phage. Um, I'd also like to thank Jacob um, for teaching me a lot of Trilium. Um, and Doc, who's an alum of some PVAs. Um, he's a great person to talk about phage with. Um, we also have some great friends to discuss results with um, and a great Trilium facility. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to discussing this with all of you. <laughs> Thanks now for a great talk. So, questions? Is it possible that what you call the tail tip is really like a neck that's lost the head and that you're looking at some kind of weird artifact where the tail bit is sticking together? Um, I have to think about that. So we've, we've tried to imagine pretty much every artifact that we, that we can imagine to explain this, and I, I don't think that that's possible um, just from looking at the micrograph. Have you seen that the, this uh, structure that the long tail in this weird complex is able to infect cells? Yes. Yeah. Um, I've done tomography of the, the whole virus on cells, and it's, it's active. Um, I have a question. So, what's the length of this tail? It's about 800 nanometers. So, I think you have a false uh, claim because some of the giant bars they for <coughs> like a two pound bars, like a two two micron tail. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you you might be also right. Remember last TBA, I was against that. They call it tail. Because uh, that's on the other side of the giant bars. You know, the giant bars has a portal like a starfish portal. That the skirt, I would call it the a hat, so it's on the other side of the portal. So in the giant virus, actually, I just attend the aquatic virus meeting. There's some more giant virus has those hair or hair, I would say. So one of them actually they found in Hawaii, a 2.3 tail. That's 2.3 micron tail. But it's again, it's on the other side of the portal. It's not, uh, in my sense, it's not uh, like a phage. It's a right. tail which your DNA comes out, comes in. So that's you, in one sense, you are also right. It's the phage tail, longest phage tail. But uh, if the giant virus guys still insist that those additional decoration is a tail, then you, you are wrong because they are much bigger, 2.3, 2.0 micron long. So that's just a comment to you. We'll look into it. Thank you. I guess related to the rivers, are the tails, I know you can't tell if they're all bendy and stuff, are they, yep. do, you, do you think they're all the same length? Yeah, so we would love to be able to like count how many tail rings are on it and see if it is a discrete number like it is, and you know, it's the same number of tail rings. I'm just wondering, like, how on earth do you know when to add whatever it is that, I guess it's something that has two full symmetric symmetry. Yeah, so, okay, so I do have <laughs> I do have an idea about how this evolved. Maybe we can talk about it over a year after or something. And to follow up on that, so that must mean that the uh, tape measure protein is very, very large. The tape measure protein, um, so the gene that encodes it is 15 kb. It's over 5,000 amino acids long. Yeah. That's one polarity. Yep. So that's, so that's what we think is orchestrating um, how you don't get tails on, uh, tail tips on both ends or heads on both ends. So there must be some specificity that's encoded in that protein. Um, it's, it's the only, <laughs> the only possible explanation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that's not an item of at all. Um, so, yeah, uh, so we don't actually know. It's a biophysical problem that's hard to imagine how it works. Um, there's a biophysicist in our department who is just like, <laughs> every time we talk about it, he's like, no, that shouldn't work. Um, so, yeah, we don't, we don't know the answer to that either, except that it happens. Um, and, you know, during, during tomography, I can see um, partially filled tails, so they're in the process of ejecting their genome. They're attached to the cell surface. Um, they're, they're definitely sending their genome into the cell. We just don't know how it works. You see structures that look like HP ninety seven GP six, but you didn't. Usually, there's something that looks like GP seven or lambda two. No, we don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're also, you know, we're really interested in how the genome gets held in as well. So like, there's often some some kind of plug. There's that's not there either, um, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, I yeah. just had a comment too. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Doolittle, but this should definitely be called the pushing for you to know. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have to terminate this very interesting discussion because uh, we are running out of time. And our last speaker of the session is. <laughs> yeah. Our last speaker is Adarin Gulet, who is going to talk about. Uh, it was something interesting, yeah, we'll see. Okay. Well, hi everyone. So before starting, I would just like to thank the organizer for this opportunity to present our recent work and also for the overall organization of this meeting. And well, I hope you still have a bit of energy at the end of this day and that you still want to know more about stage structure and assembly. Because for the next 15 minutes, I will take you on an exploration of the structural diversity of the host binding machineries of phages and phages in particular that infect mycobacteria. And we call them mycobacterial phages. And this was done using the machine learning uh, protein structure prediction software as a whole. And um, for this presentation, uh, really my plans are not only to present there's um, a first social insight into this machinery, which is important um, uh, to um, decipher the molecular basis of this host interactions, but also um, to uh, illustrate and uh, illustrate and stress on the power of alpha fold two or alpha fold for a stage social biology and for our research project. And we've uh, we've already seen some examples uh, today, but here I'm pushing the just a bit more. So why? <coughs> Why exploring host binding machineries of uh, microba microbacterial phages? So, actually, these phages have been collected at a very large scale over the last decade, and uh, to, date, uh, to date, there are nearly uh, 13,000 phages identified and listed in this actinal bacterial phage database, and there are also more than 2,000 uh, um, genome sequences available. Uh, there's phages based on the um, uh, genomic diversity are classified into saturation clusters, and they are also from singletones. And they infect uh, non-pathogenic uh, mycobacterium species like Smegmatis and also pathogenic species like the well known tuberculosis, such as this, and so on. And so um, we have this large reservoir of um, uh, mycobacterial phages that offers promising perspectives to better understand phage biology, phage diversity, and even to use them for therapeutic applications. But uh, surprisingly, at the moment, the molecular uh, mechanism used by these phages to infect the host remain fully understood. And this can be illustrated by the fact that even though there are so many um, phages and sequences available, there's only one low resolution 3D structure of the mycobacterial phages, and that's uh, the phage uh, called Aokaria that infects abscess. So it's a typical uh, species of phage with a capsid, a tail, and the host binding machinery of the phage. So um, there's a critical need of structural information on these phages uh, to better understand their biology and, in particular, the model pattern of the, the host binding machinery that is important to um, uh, bind to host specific uh, cellular receptors at the onset of viral infection. Um, and so, uh, before going into the details of our structures, 
I'm going to briefly summarize what we've learned from social studies of psychophages of the host and machinery um, of psychophages that infect gram positive bacteria and in particular uh, for those who bind to uh, polysaccharide um, uh, receptors. So basically, these machinery are um, highly modular and they are often referred to as uh, legal like assemblies. And they're built uh, from a, a common core made up of two um, proteins. So the DIS or distal protein that makes an exameric ring that is bound at one hand of the at one hand to its tail and at the other to a primer of the tail protein or tail associated with it. So here, the tail, I'm seeing the tail that is uh, said to be uh, small, but it actually can be much longer of up to 2,000 residues here, and it can contain uh, domains like carbohydrate binding modules that are involved in host binding. In a similar way, the gift can be uh, functionalized with CDM, and then other proteins can enter to this core, but it, it's not necessarily, uh, not always the case, and for instance, uh, some the so-called RBT for receptor binding protein can uh, be encouraged to this core. And in the case of the stages that bind to uh, polysaccharide uh, receptors, the receptor binding domain is often a uh, lectin like domain and the RBT as standard of the trial. And uh, I, I also have to add a few words about the potential microbacterial receptors because um, the, the cell wall of my mycobacteria differs uh, from that of other gram-positive actinobacteria in that uh, it contains an arabinogalacan layer bound to the peptidoglycide on one hand and bound to the other hand to a mycomembrane, which is rich in mycolic acids, um, which are um, long fatty acid chains. And in this mycomembrane, they are also glycolipid and phospholipid. And on top of, of that, at the surface, there is a capsule containing phospholipid, glycopeptidolipid, and protein. And a few papers reported that um, phospholipid and glycolipid are the receptors of these microphages listed here. And actually, either the, the lipid or the sugar moieties uh, have been shown to be involved in host binding, depending on the page. Well, so having said that, um, so we have uh, Many, many uh, mycobacterial pages are available for which there's no, barely no social information available, and in particular regarding the host binding machinery. So, basically, the, the question we wanted to address is what are the composition and architecture of these machineries, and uh, more specifically, do they contain any uh, domain or um, uh, proteins uh, to adapt to the peculiar mycobacterial cell wall? And so, to address this question, we selected uh, seven stages that belong to different clusters, that infect different hosts, and that assemble host binding machineries of different composition based on uh, genome analysis, and, and basically they have different hosts. And we use AlphaFold to predict the structure of all these components. And it is important to note that um, as it has been acknowledged by um, um, a consortium of social biologists, um, uh, those, the, the, the alpha of features are really uh, comparable to those that you could obtain with experimental techniques, provided uh, you really take into account the, the confidence score. Because every prediction comes with two one or two confidence score. Uh, always, you always have the PLDDC value that gives you confidence along the sequence, and so if you are above 70%, you are good. And then if you are um, predicting uh, an oligomer or even a uh, single protein with different domains, you have what is called uh, the predicted aligned error plot, which gives you a confidence um, uh, on the relative position of the different domains. So, uh, and then, once you're uh, okay with those values, you can uh, interpret and analyze the structure, the structure as usual by searching for the columns with the value server, by analyzing the surface properties and, and things like that. And so, um, okay, so let's start uh, having a look at the structures. And first, we're going to see the detail core. And first, deep proteins. And actually, the, the different predictive structure can be classified in two groups. So, first group contains, um, let's say, that basic deep with um, the, the two usual domains, the base and the galactic domain, as that in this page. And others have also, uh, I'm not sure that you're 
saying very well, but um, they have very, very long loops at the end terminus and also uh, here in the galaxy domain. And this is a quite unusual feature. And so it's probably, they are probably uh, involved in the assembly of the whole machinery uh, by uh, making contact with other components. And there is another group of these uh, in which uh, one can find the domain insertion and uh, like the, the, the CDM, uh, uh, the carbohydrate binding modules. And so the presence of those modules indicates that this stage is um, uh, recognized for the separate uh, phase three sector. And for this stage, there is uh, this domain that does not have any structural involved in the PDD. So whether it has a, only a structural or uh, a host binding function remains to be determined. Then, regarding the car, uh, they are all soft cars. And for the three stages, they are uh, totally naked, but all the others have their extra edices at the end terminus and also the, uh, at the bottom of the, the trimer. And again, that's an unusual feature that has never been observed before. And we think also that uh, they are likely involved in assembling the, the, uh, the whole machinery. And for Wildcat, for these stages, there is uh, again a CDM that is actually highly similar to the other one. And so this uh, again indicates that the stages recognize the product. Then uh, we're going to see other and uh, more interesting um, uh, features with the host binding proteins. First, because um, all the stages but Aokaya and Iska have um, three host binding proteins. One, what we call the receptor binding proteins, and then they have two uh, additional adhesion proteins. And second, because we observed that um, polyglycine rich domains that we call brush domains are present in um, all the, uh, the, 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 the carpet, yeah. so in all stages but one. And um, they're likely, uh, they are present either in the RDP or, and or in the additional adhesion protein. And they are likely involved in host binding. And actually, those domains were observed in only five native native proteins, and they were thought uh, to be a rare in nature. But it seems that it's not really the case. So here is a gallery of the RDP structures shown as primers. And for all the stages, they, they look uh, similar overall. They are elongated. At the end terminus, they have alkylases and structures that are likely involved in uh, making contact with the distal core. And at the C terminus, there are, there are different um, a variety of, of domains. So again, carbohydrate binding module, lexin like domain, and the, the brush domain. And for, of the, for some of them, they, they have also carbohydrate binding modules in, within the long road. And so again, the, the, the presence of the CDM and lexin like domain indicate that this stage is recognized as sugar. So our family and ISCA are only the RDPs, no additional uh, addition protein. And um, they both have a tandem of CDM and uh, a lexin like domain here. Um, that is actually also found in some Clepsida uh, stage uh, depolymerase, again indicating that the stage is recognized for those. And for our carrier, there is this additional brush domain at the end terminus of the protein. So this brush domain is made up of um, a beta layer of uh, a beta sandwich, sorry, a three layer beta sandwich that makes the, the brush hand, and then a bundle of uh, um, polyglycine um, elicis that makes the, the brush pairs. And even though, as I said before, there, there are only two uh, examples of proteins that do contain this domain, one of them is the uh, C-terminal domain of the Salmonella stage X. 16 long tail fiber adhesion that you can see here, and which looks like, well, it's basically the same uh, overall fold, uh, okay. And in this case, uh, it was done, shown that the loop here, the loop at the, the tip of the, um, of the brush hairs are involved in host binding and also they play a role in determining the host specificity. So this indicates that this brush domain in mycobacterial cages are likely also involved in the uh, host binding. But I come back to this uh, domain in, in this slide. So then we had a look at the two stages. Then for all of those stages, they have RBPs plus additional adhesion proteins. 
So there's three stages. They have only CBM and electronic like domain in their abilities. But if you, well, if you have a look at their um, additional abilities coaching, they actually only contain the first domain. So in our area, they were the Lexin, the Lexin CDN, and Brush domain all in the single protein. So those pages is actually uh, the two domains are present but sharing between different proteins. And for the last uh, two pages, so this one refers as a brush and a CDN in, in its RBP. And it's in, uh, in its vision proteins, you can find the Lexin domains here while it's present in, in the ability for the other stages, and in this one there is also a brush. And so one cat is a kind of, uh, yeah, a, 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 a pretty different from the other, because in this adhesion uh, protein, one can find the penicillin binding line domain, um, indicating that it's also, it could also be involved in a binding the peptidoglycan, but this one is very different from the other. Um, and so then if we have a look at all those brush domains, uh, a striking feature is that they uh, um, expose at the surface hydrophobic uh, residues um, with clusters that uh, can contain up, up to 11 residues. And this is not a common feature for a soluble protein, except for those that interact with liquids. So we, um, we, we suggest that those uh, brush domains that expose their hydrophobic residues are likely involved in the combined. And so, um, after having predicted the uh, features for the individual components, we then tested whether we could use our support to um, predict how those different components could interact with each other and uh, to see whether we could um, start building the whole assembly. And so, in our area, we, we have this structure, and so we can see that there is a, a small road at, at the tip here that has to be the RBP because our area has only this style and RBP. Here for, for that piece, uh, well, okay, so you have to believe me that there is something that could be um, the, the long RBP that would, uh, that would determine the structure. And so we predicted the structure of a primer of power plus a primer of the RBP and actually just the end terminal part of the world, uh, otherwise it, it's going, um, it's too many residues for us at home. And we actually obtained those complexes in which we can see that uh, the three and terminal releases of the RBP are actually um, buried within the, the tile uh, or cavity. And the interaction seems to be uh, driven by uh, electrostatic uh, uh, properties. And here, oh no, ah uh, yeah. And here I'm showing you this PAA plot because, uh, uh, well, I quite like it because really this uh, green line here tells you that it corresponds to the, the small indices here, and it tells you that its position related to the whole time primer is highly uh, confident. So, well, I, one can test this, this picture. And well, I think our message is just remember that alpha cell is really well adapted for such spectral biology because it's maybe uh, well, it's totally uh, nowadays the only technique that can, that, that can give you uh, reliable structural uh, insight into um, large, flexible, and multi domain proteins. And in the case of uh, mycobacterial phages, um, it, they really have uh, unusual features, and uh, among which maybe the, the, the presence of those growth domains that are likely more common in nature than, than expected. Uh, are also involved, uh, likely involved in binding lipids of the mycobacteria. And with this, um, I would just like to thank uh, Christian Candillo, who is the narrator in the group, and who worked with me in this, in this project. And actually, for the last two years, Christian and I kept, uh, kept playing with us at home too, in, in exploring all our favorite stages, but now we are kind of exploring a bit. And uh, yeah, thank you uh, for uh, your attention, and I'm now happy to take any questions. Thank you for letting me talk. Any questions? Thank you. Um, <coughs> cool stuff. So, I have a question about the brush, the brush domains and the exposed type of residues. Uh, do you think that those could actually be sort of a, like hydrophobic interaction sites between the brush domains 
it takes out multi motivation instead of actually finding the liquid. I, I, again, the um, cell wall is a different piece, but oftentimes, with like, uh, if you just have a phospholipid bilayer, you, know, you think, oh, the hydrophobic ratio is going to stick to that, but actually, you have the head group, which are, uh, mm -hmm. which are not hydrophobic, you actually have to develop get through that barrier first, you know, just having an exposed hydrophobic residue doesn't make sense mean that it actually is in the membrane. Yeah, I agree with you. We, we don't really know then how it could work, but there is also this capsule at the surface containing three lipids, and so maybe that's, that's where it goes. I don't know. And there, there's are the two papers and very full papers, so kind of in terms of uh, details, it, it's not that much, indicating that some stages recognize lipids. Which one? I don't know. They don't know. But it's an open question here. And first, I have to check experimentally that they do bind. That's only the beginning of the very long story. You? Yeah. Uh, um, I have played a bit with the whole trying to predict the viral structures, not the uh, stages. Uh, and in, in my experience, it's not very good. Perhaps because some of the protein protein interfaces are different in viruses than in normal protein because you have more charge residues, for instance, yes. this kind of stuff. Do you think in the case of phages it's different because you have much, many more proteins in the PDB? But uh, that's, that's a big debate. Um, so the structures in the PDB are mainly used to train the, the software, and I'm not using them as uh, like a restraint. Um, it's not. Uh, it is also said that if you don't have a lot of uh, sequence homologs, then your um, prediction is not uh, it's not good. And it's actually not true because, for instance, we have an example for an RBP from a single joint, so it, it means only one sequence. Uh, it predicts the, the structure that is uh, very close to the one that is in the PDB, but it's not because in the PDB. And so to go back to your question, I'm not. Uh, no, that, 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 um, but then it was not good. What do you mean by not good? Did you see like um, extended stretches and again, yeah, okay, it's not good. But does this protein interact with others? Because sometimes what I, I can see, and here I'm not saying this, but for the this with the long, um, the long loop, when I'm adding the tau, then they become ordered. So when, when you have bits like that, it's because maybe you have to push the system a, a bit more. But then, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. We've got one more. Okay, if you are not that hungry, if you can have one more. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, how, how big is the serotype diversity of these mycobacteria, or is it um, because for the staphylococci, the serotype diversity is kind of limited, and then you have a kind of limited series of uh, uh, receptor binding of, of binding proteins that would rather yeah, be um, responsible for attachment, but not for the final infection step. So, to distinguish? Uh, so, yeah, there are, there are many stereotypes, and there are some examples. Uh, you know, you have a stage that infects pragmatis. It cannot bind and infect pragmatis. It can also bind to tuberculosis, but not infect. So, yeah. Yeah which, would make, yes. yeah, which would make sense. Maybe I just add one quick question. Right. Is there enzymatic activity in some of these uh, uh, components? I, I don't know. For the, no, I don't uh, know. There are only CBM, lectin, like domain, the brush domain, there are not supposed to be enzymes. And for the, and for the pin filling by the lag domain, they are, I've I've checked, and the um, fatality residues are not there. So it's like if it has evolved to only bind, Something but not good. And there are maybe other proteins in the genome uh, that I've missed. Usually they are all between the TNP and the lysine, but for now. Okay, no more questions. Thank you. Thank you.